Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, bright and early for uh, hopefully a bit of a mind uh, bender today. Uh, this FS Club webinar is about functional programming in finance, and we are delighted to have Professor Philip Wadler here from the University of Edinburgh. Now, you'll know me. I'm Michael Mainelli. I'm uh, the chairman of Zian Group, and it really is my delight to be able to introduce these lectures. Um, but I thought it would be important to have today's lecture for the very simple reason that this is an area that is little explored and yet is absolutely fundamental to the way that we build IT systems. Um, I myself uh, began back in the 70s playing around with LISP. Uh, once people encounter functional programming, which is all class of languages that Philip will explore with, with us, uh, you tend to find that they're quite entrancing. And like any programmer, I'm a big fan of XKCD. Last night, I drifted off while reading a list book. Suddenly, I was bathed in a suffusion of blue at once. Just like they said, I felt a great enlightenment. I saw the naked structure of list code unfold before me. The patterns and meta patterns dance, syntax faded, and I swam in the purity of quantified conception of ideas manifest. Truly, this was the language from which the gods wrought the universe. Nah, it's not. It's not. I mean, ostensibly, yes. Honestly, we hacked most of it together with Perl. And I think as we look at the state of uh, financial systems, we can see the mess of tangled spaghetti code. And does functional programming offer a new opportunity uh, to clean some of that out and actually move ourselves onto a better platform? Or are we deluding ourselves? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, the agenda today uh, is fairly straightforward. Uh, firstly, I'm going to thank our sponsors, because without them, we wouldn't be able to range so widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. Uh, I'm going to get out of the way as quickly as I can and hand you over to Philip. Uh, Philip's going to talk for about 25 minutes. Uh, it is a bit technical, but we are here to explain, uh, and it should be a tremendous amount of fun. And I do hope that many of you come out of this, as I am, uh, inspired by the potential to really renew the way in which we develop systems. I might also point out that Philip himself is very interested in hearing about experiences in the financial sector using uh, any type of uh, any type of functional programming language. So uh, with that, Philip, the floor is very much yours. Uh, we're going to do a little handover here uh, for just a second, so give us a moment. Actually, before you do the handover, didn't you have a survey prepared? I'd like to do the survey first. Well, that's great. We will, we will conduct the survey. Okay, folks, uh, just here, uh, which functional programming languages might you have encountered in finance? And please select any that apply, Haskell, my old favorite list, OCaml, Racket or Scheme, or Scala. Just get those votes in. Okay. Over half the audience has voted. I'll close the poll now and share the results. Actually, very interesting, Philip. 60% uh, wow. of the audience voted, and you can start to see the range here. So of those who are programming, half are using Haskell, uh, a third Lisp, and a third is split amongst the other three. Uh, right. I'm right. I'm so I'm guessing that we have what? Eleven percent is one respondent. Yeah. Uh, but still, this is um, an interesting distribution. Okay. So uh, yeah. When you panel and so on. Right. Good. You'll, you'll send that to me for later? Yes. Great. Cool. Um, Haskell wins. Anyway. Yay. <laughs> uh, so show my Darn. screen. OK, I'm going to talk to you about functional programming in finance. There'll be a long time for question and answer at the end, but if uh, I say something that you don't understand, and it's possible for you to leap in with a question via um, a chat that Michael can read or whatever. Just go sure. ahead and do that. Um, I'm happy to take questions during the presentation if there's anything I've said that you don't understand. And then uh, other kinds of questions or arguments or whatnot we can have at the end. Right, so I work for the University of Edinburgh. I'm a professor there, and uh, I also consult for a cryptocurrency firm called IOHK. I'll mention a little bit of what we do there as we go on. So I'm gonna start by talking about 
Haskell and finance, and they'll say something about other functional languages as well. So um, I start with Haskell because I know it best. I'm one of the principal designers of Haskell. It was designed by a committee uh, starting in 1987. So it's actually gotten to be a mature programming language. Um, when we started out, we had no idea that Haskell could end up in things like banks. We did say that one of the things it should be good for is um, professional uses of programming. But if, if you had told us back when we were doing this, oh yeah, it will actually be used for doing things like um, modeling proteins so that people can cure HIV or um, used in banks, we would not have believed that. And the way I explain it to people now, uh, I got this from Jay Moore, who's had a similar thing with the um, language that he's designed, is that you know when you start, there are a very tiny number of users. But what you do is you just keep doing it year after year after year, and your students graduate, and they start doing things with it. So um, the basically, the way to do, um, have an impact on the world is to do something and then keep doing it for 20 or 30 years. And after that period of time, you actually begin to see some impact. So this is our logo for Haskell. Uh, it actually involves a lambda that you can see here. And this other thing, the greater than followed by an equal sign, is a symbol that we use in Haskell for something called a monad that I helped introduce. It was actually based on work done by Eugenio Maggi, who was at the University of Edinburgh at the time, where I am now. Uh, at the time, I was at the University of Glasgow on the other side of the country. So he came up with the idea and I suggested it as a way of structuring functional programs and it became one of the signatures of Haskell. What monads are that are interesting is that um, right, almost all programming languages involve side effects like uh, print something on the screen or more importantly, do this trade. Um, a functional language is just about values, right? So we're very used to values. Um, an example of this is something like you've got the numbers one and two and you add them together and you get the number three. Of course, the number three is something completely separate from one and two. Um, and similarly with matrices, uh, right? You take one matrix, add it to another matrix and you get a third matrix. Now in most languages like Python, this was driven home to me by um, one of the students in my first year class who was learning Haskell, already knew Python, but wait, 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 wait what's going on? Um, what you need to do when you add two matrices is overwrite the first matrix with the result of adding in the numbers from the se second matrix. You need to change things as you go along. That's kind of writing as an example of a side effect. And we just don't have those in Haskell. Those are um, ruled out. And one of the huge advantages of that is it makes it much easier when you're trying to do um, concurrent or parallel programming. So I'll say more about that in a minute, uh, but, but he was just very confused that you have to overwrite the other matrix. You can imagine trying to do the mathematics of matrices if every time you operated on a matrix, it changed under your feet. You didn't have the same thing anymore. The mathematics would become um, very different to formulate. That, that's a polite way of saying you'd have to be crazy to do that. So um, what mathematicians do is what we do by default in Haskell, and then if you really do need a side effect, we have these monads for structuring that. So the idea is, yeah, you can do side effects when you need them, but they're not the default. Um, they're the thing you do when you need it, rather than the thing that you do all the time, um, introducing the extra complexity of things changing under your feet, whether you need them or not. So I, mentioned, I said I'm gonna say something about concurrency. So an example application of this, is one or two of you may have heard of Facebook. And Facebook, of course, um, publishes a large number of posts every day. And every time before publishing a post to somebody else's feed, they check it for things, right? They have a bunch of heuristics for saying, um, is this spam? Is this uh, misinformation from the Russian government? Is this misinformation from the US president or what have you? Uh, and so they've got a lot, huge number of um, filters that they need to apply before posting anything. So this is a place where concurrency can be used. And so Simon Marlow, who is one of the uh, principal developers of the um, main Haskell compiler, which is called GHC, GHC for the Glasgow Haskell compiler. 
It's actually now maintained by um, Simon Peyton Jones at Microsoft in Redmond. But Simon Marlowe and Simon Peyton Jones used to work together. And Simon Marlowe then went off to Facebook where he implemented these filters I mentioned in a library in Haskell called Haxel. And the key thing here is um, it, uh, one of the nice things about monads is they are programmable side effects. So you can decide how you're going to program things. So um, he made up a particular monad that was good for marshalling um, computations over a large number of computers. Uh, and again, this takes advantage of the fact that you're not trying to update memory all the time. If you're trying to update memory all the time, those updates would have to be shared across all the computers. But the point here is um, you can do break your computation up across several computers and then accumulate the results. So it's a library to help you to do that. And one of the things that functional languages, including Haskell, are good at is because they're not doing updates all the time, but only doing them when they're really needed, uh, that aids in distributing things across a large number of computers. The problem if you're doing updates all the time, I guess many of you will know this, what's called shared memory parallelism or shared memory concurrency, is every single process is writing onto that same shared memory. And so if you have two processes that are both dealing, or two threads, they're both dealing with the same uh, piece of shared memory, those computations can interleave in many ways. And basically, reasoning about your program involves thinking about all possible ways things could interleave and when necessary introducing locks or some other mechanism so that you don't have bad interactions with two processes writing on the same bit of memory at once. So um, the advantage of a functional approach is you do need to worry about that, but much less often. You only need to worry about that for the side effects you need rather than for everything. Right. Otherwise, even just adding two matrices gets you into worrying about, wait, how can these interact in parallel? Whereas um, with Haskell, right, we deal with the matrices in a completely different way where they don't change under your feet. And so that makes the problems for dealing with concurrency much easier. So Facebook is one example of this sort of thing being used at scale. Now, completely different use of this is um, one of the nice things about doing things in this very mathematical style is it becomes easier to prove properties. Again, because you just reason about the values, you don't re need to reason about, wait, how are these values changing in the memory? So you only model the memory when you need to, and the rest of the time, you're just dealing with values, which is much easier. So um, functional languages pretty much underpin every single um, computerized system for proof in existence. So the main ones, I'll say more about these later, uh, are based on functional languages. Uh, and an example of this is the SEL4 operating system. So a group of people uh, at NICTA in Australia, which is now goes by the name Route 66, they changed their name, um, took an entire mobile phone operating system and proved it correct. And the particular technique they used was to actually write the whole operating system first in Haskell and then um, prove that correct using uh, Isabel, which is one of these automated proof systems, um, and then translate that by hand to C and do a proof again in Isabel that C, which does have side effects, and the Haskell were doing the same thing. And so they actually have an efficient operating system completely proved correct um, one of the main people involved in this is a man named Liam O'Connor, and I have to mention him because he's just joined me as um, a young staff member at uh, the University of Edinburgh. So I'm very pleased that we've got him working with us. So anyhow, you can take a whole operating system, write it in Haskell, translate to C, and prove it correct. That, by the way, right, translating to C by hand, proving it correct by hand is very hard work. What Liam's PhD work is about is a more is a different programming language which automatically compiles to C. So you can sort of write things in this one language and take two views of it, one of it, one as if it were Haskell for proving it correct, and then one as if it were C for executing efficiently. Um, very clever idea. Which, by the way, 
just that there's room for things in the language world other than Haskell, which is absolutely true. Okay, so that's a second example. And then my third example is, sorry, we have to go while um, Keynote's busy materializing all these things, but oops, too many, go back. So we've got, I think, seven different financial institutions here. And all of these uh, use Haskell for a fair chunk of their work. So for instance, Standard Charter um, does a lot of their work in a language called Mu, which is just a dialect of Haskell that I um, originally created by Ogleson, uh, who's one of the uh, main people in the Haskell community. Um, one of the things about Haskell is it's lazy which means it does not do computations unless it needs to. So the time at which a computation happens is when you need it, which by the way, is one reason for not having side effects. Because if you have side effects that might happen, whenever you happen to need this thing, you don't know when they're gonna happen. It's very hard to uh, keep things. Uh, so be, Haskell being a pure language, one without side effects, makes it um, possible to make it lazy. But in fact, um, sometimes right, laziness greatly increases efficiency if it turns out you never need to compute this thing. But often you need everything, especially in numerical computations. And so there can be an advantage for speed in being a non-lazy language, a strict language. And so that's what Leonard did. He just did a dialect of Haskell that was strict called mu, and then standard charted uses it for a lot of things. Um, and all these institutes do a lot. Tsuru is quite interesting. I did a little bit of preparation for this talk because I don't know that much about functional languages and finance. I'm hoping you guys will um, tell me a bit more about that. And uh, Tsuru um, built themselves as an entirely Haskell shop. And so I asked them about that and they said, well, um, actually we're mainly using Rust now. And the reason again is that they are doing um, simulations of the financial market, which are heavily numerical and therefore better off if they're strict. Also, um, if you're manipulating large chunks of memory, functional languages don't worry about memory allocation. They do something called gar um, garbage collection, right? You just allocate the memory, and then the way you check if you don't need the memory anymore is you um, traverse the entire storage, um, seeing what's being used and what isn't. Uh, so, Garbage collection can be fairly expensive. It used to be quite rare. Only a couple of languages like Lisp, which was mentioned earlier, used garbage collection. Um, and functional languages used garbage collection. Then when Java came in, it used garbage collection. So now garbage collection is fairly common. But before that, it wasn't. But garbage collection can be expensive. So in Rust, they do the normal thing, which is you just deallocate the memory when you're done with it. Now, there's a problem with deallocating memory when you're done with it, which is maybe you will deallocate something by mistake when you're not done with it, or maybe you'll be done with something and you'll forget to deallocate it. So both of these are serious errors. If you look at code written in C or C++, those errors crop up quite a lot, right? Having that kind of error is a serious issue. Uh, in Rust, what they did is they adopted ideas from something called linear logic, which says, so um, right in logic, you have a fact, a fact is true. You can use that fact as many times as you like. But some things you want to treat more like cake or like money, right? A cake, if you eat it, you don't have it anymore. It's a resource that you can use exactly once. Well, maybe let it go stale, but what you want to do is use it exactly once. Similarly, exactly with money, right? Mon money cannot, you cannot spend the same dollar twice. Um, so linear logic provides a way of modeling that sort of thing. And that's built in to the Rust programming language. They have a type system that keeps track of um, that this chunk of memory should be used exactly once. And they have a technique called borrowing that says, well, just temporarily, I want lots of people to be able to use this. And then when they're done, it should be declared that they're done and then it should be back to there's just one pointer to this thing so that you know when it's safe to allocate something and even the system tells you when you should be deallocating something. Uh, so that's Rust. 
So because of that, it can do things in uh, some things much more efficiently than you can in a functional language, but it's more work, right? You have to keep track of these linear types. You've got to keep track of the memory uh, that you're updating. Uh, but what they found at Suru is that by rewriting everything from Haskell to Rust, that um, they got a large increase in speed. This is partly because the Rust compiler does much better at um, generating SIMD instructions than the Haskell uh, compiler does for using concurrent uh, processing uh, in the you know, that's built into many processors now. So they actually found that they were shifting to Rust. These other places, as far as I know, are all still using Haskell, right? It's a trade-off. It's very different sorts of things. If you have something that's very computation intensive, like a simulation, you might be better off with a language tailored for that, like Rust. Um, but for many purposes, you just want to be able to write it down quickly, but be able to understand it to make sure it's doing the right thing. And for those, a functional language is better. Uh, right, so there's Haskell and Rust being used by Zero Capital. So those are the examples I wanted to go through with Haskell. As I mentioned, there are many other functional languages being used in finance. One example is OCaml. The um, company that does the most with that is a company called Jane Street. In fact, they've been very good members of the community. So not only do they make heavy use of OCaml, but they also, excuse me, not only do they make heavy use of OCaml, but they also, um, sorry, they also contribute a lot back to the community. So they're one of the um, main sources of maintenance for OCaml and building useful libraries for OCaml and releasing them open source to the community and that sort of thing. So they're good community players, which is great. Um, and then they've made, they're quite a large firm now, and they've made quite a lot of money by doing automated trading in OCaml. And uh, Jeroen Minsky, who's one of the leaders there, um, if you ever get a chance to get him on this show, you should do, and he'll explain to you how they started using OCaml because a few of them could sit down, step through the program together, and make sure that it was doing what it's supposed to do, right? Automated trading, uh, if you get it wrong, it can give away millions of dollars within a fraction of a second. So you really want to make sure that your program is doing what you expect. And they found that functional programming was their secret weapon in getting that right and being able to write programs very quickly, but being sure that those programs are doing what they intend. So I'm at 23 minutes. I could stop there or I could go on and talk the more audience about really like you to keep going, right. Philip. There, there's a, there, I think the audience would really like you to keep going. This is super. Okay, great. So let me say a little bit now about domain specific languages. So um, a domain specific language is a language aimed at a particular purpose. And actually what I like to say about functional languages is that they are domain specific languages. They are domain specific languages for creating other domain specific languages. So one of the strong points of a functional language is it's very good for implementing some other language in that language. And um, in fact, in the International Conference on Functional Programming, uh, back at the turn of the millennium, there was this paper published by some Peyton Jones, Jean-Marc Eber, and Julian Seward. Right, and you can see the Glasgow connection. Simon used to be, and I both were professors at um, Glasgow. And then Simon moved on to Microsoft, as I mentioned. And um, the three of them published this paper on composing contracts. And it was about a small domain specific language for describing contracts. So the sorts of things in it were um, exchanging an amount of resource, such as um, dollars or pounds or possibly um, deeds to a bit of property or what have you. Um, so there could be um, an exchange, which meant this person who owned the resource gives it to this other person that owns the resource. They don't have to be people. They're principles in general. They might be companies or what have you. And then you could, of course, sequence these things to so give several things. You could have a choice. And then you could um, say, 
this next action, you have to wait until this time or up to this time. Somebody may initiate a choice up to this time. And you could see that you could use a simple language like that to um, encode various kinds of futures, various kinds of swaps, all sorts of financial instruments could be easily um, captured in a small language like that. And because it was not a general purpose language, because the only things you could express were these, it became easy to analyze. So you would write out these small programs and immediately there were or um, yes, small programs in this domain specific language. And immediately there were two different things that they could do with them. One is, of course, you just simulate the execution. So you provide something that says, all right, this person can now initiate this trade. So they've got, um, say the contract says they've got a choice of these three things. So the software would offer them the choice and then they would make the choice and the software would keep track of the time. And if at some time it's supposed to go from three choices to two, you would suddenly see your options go from three to two or what have you. So it's just very simply uh, automating the trading process. But the other thing you could do with the same um, program is value it. So, right, you could do something like a Monte Carlo simulation to work out, okay, what is the likely value of this thing? So I'm sure that you, as people in finance, are much more familiar with that process than I am. But the point is, because it was a domain-specific language, you could automate the process of doing this valuation. Um, so there, um, basically, this is always the trade-off with domain-specific languages. There are fewer things you can express, but it becomes easier to analyze what you've done. So there are various properties of the program you've written that you might analyze, or some are just built in. It's like it could be built into this thing that you never duplicate a resource, right? Each resource just remains used exactly once. You never suddenly mistakenly turn $1 into $2 or mistakenly turn $1 into $0. That's automatically guaranteed by the form in which these contracts are written. So there are lots of different uses of these things. So this one paper has generated at least four or five practical industrial uses of this that I know of. So one is a company called Lexify, which was founded by Jean-Marc Aber, one of the co-authors of that paper. And they just um, specialize. Uh, generally, they are the ones who learn the domain-specific language. So you come to them with the contract that you want formalized, and they will formalize it for you. Back, so this, I remember, was first time at the turn of the century. In 2008, when all the markets crashed because people were having great trouble valuating um, these different credit swaps, which were uh, deliberately quite complicated, uh, so that they were actually hard to see what the value was. And it turned out people thought their value was much more than they were. So at this point, Lexify came forward and said, come to us. We can write out a program in this domain-specific language that will value your credit swaps for you. They did not, I'm sad to say, end up dominating that market. They ended up specializing in a different market. I'm not a finance person. Uh, so when they explained to me which market they were currently specializing in, I couldn't follow that. But they're doing well making inroads into that one particular market. I'm rather sad that they didn't end up actually dominating the credit swap market because I think that could have been good for the world in demystifying what's going on in these very complicated contracts. I still hope uh, that in the future, some language based on these ideas will be used for that purpose. I think that would be an important thing to do. So that's Lexify. Uh, Digital Asset is another company. They're actually in the cryptocurrency space. They have this specific language called um, DAML, which stands for Digital Asset Markup Language, I think. But it's, ah, you know the answer. Yeah, yeah you're right. Right. Um, but again, it's uh, a descendant of the language from this original 2000 paper, um, again, aimed at certain uh, purposes. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about it because I don't understand it that well yet. I really have to learn more about this particular one. Uh, there's a company called Deon Digital, founded by Fritz Henglein, a colleague of mine at the University of Copenhagen, again, based on this sort of language. 
And the interesting thing is they've noted that you can have this rule called business engineer. Uh, well, I'll say more about business engineers in a moment. And then another language of this kind is something called Marlowe, which uh, is one of the languages uh, for the ADA cryptocurrency coming from IOHK. So I've been involved with the development of Marlowe. This comes from the company I consult for. And um, this just shows you that you can write the, so this is a little program, a domain specific language. This is actually a Haskell data structure. For those of you who know Lisp, you'll realize this looks an awful lot like Lisp. And then this is just the textual format, but we also have a more graphical format for building these things. And then we have a, um, many of these languages are just available online through a web interface. So you can go write your Haskell online and then execute it online. And this is what we're recommending for most people as the way to write uh, cryptocurrency programs for uh, Mar sorry, Cardano, which is our blockchain platform. Ada is the name of the currency. And then we have another language, which I won't tell you about, called Plutus, which is basically just a library for Haskell. So you can write in full Haskell or you can write in this limited language. For most purposes, the limited language will be good enough. And we recommend that because that ensures certain properties and should be easier to analyze. So all of these languages, so this is a slide, as you can see from day on digital, but all of these languages, because they're domain specific, instead of hiring a programmer to do it, you can hire what's called a um, business engineer. And so instead of having a business analyst to design the thing and then a developer to implement it and to test or to test it, that is that the business engineer does all three of these things because this language is so um, limited, it's easy for somebody trained in the finances rather than somebody trained in computing to learn it and make use of it. So I think this is a, a very important idea that by using a domain specific language, you can move from needing developers aided by a business analyst and a tester to having a business engineer do all three steps. So Day on Digital has several examples, right, where they've trained people up in various companies to be business engineers. And I think that's going to be, whereas Lexify, for example, they don't do this. What you do is you get the person, you hire somebody at Lexify to do it for you. But I think this idea that you're going to train people up to be business engineers is going to become increasingly important. If you're wondering what a business engineer looks like, I found a picture of one on the web. Okay, that's me at 33 minutes. I could say a bit about formal methods as well, or I could stop here. I'm happy to do whichever you want. Well, I think we could probably do both, but just to give you a little bit of feedback, um, Philip Molyneux is asking, how do we reconcile the culture split between those who are already functional programming fans and those who regard it as too mathematical, too abstract? Um, right, so there's this issue that people like what they know and often they're afraid of what they don't know so many developers find this idea of doing things in a very mathematical way really scary um, one way that i like to put this is they're afraid of anything written in an italic font right mathematicians like to put their formulas in italics whereas um right as programmers we put everything in teletype font and you see something in, in italic font and then suddenly people go, this is too hard for me. And people look at mathematics and they say, this is too hard for me. There's a um, quote that I love from, I think it's like the 16th century. No, 17th century, the 1600s. And I'm sorry if I'm having a senior moment and the name of the person who said this isn't coming to me. But what he said is, if you have a hard problem to solve and you can solve it using mathematics and you don't use mathematics, then it's as if you were searching for something in the dark and you had a candle to hand, but you didn't use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mathematics yeah. is our candle in the dark. So everybody who's afraid of mathematics, I would just say, please don't be. Um, I, I think that under, you know, seeing, I understand that people look at mathematics and say, oh, this looks hard. What I don't understand 
is that those same people look at JavaScript and say, oh, this is fine. I think that understanding all the um, little corners and edges of JavaScript, mm. right? JavaScript has a core that's very nice, but it has all these weird um, corners and coercions, and people have done uh, funny videos called what about all the strange corners of JavaScript. Programmers don't mind about that, but all of a sudden, if you talk to them about mathematics, which is designed in a very logically rigorous way and has to be to be accepted as mathematics, uh, they think this is too hard. So mathematics well, is actually designed to be sensible, easy to use, and give you the right answers. I would just say don't be afraid of mathematics. And then the well, other thing I would say is that, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say that kind of leads naturally onto one of the other questions here. Uh, Ian okay. West London is curious, are these, uh, uh, are these functional languages easier to check and audit than the more familiar languages or do they present additional challenges in terms of checking inputs and processes or delivering the expected outputs? So, Right, that's a great question. Um, and I, I touched on that before when I said, look, at Jane Street, what they chose to do, and also at all these banks that are using Haskell, what they chose to do is use functional languages because you can write the programs down quickly and be sure they're doing what you want. So that's the auditing process. So I believe that these are easier to audit. Um, of course, your auditors will need to be trained in those languages, which leads on to the other point I was going to make, which is, um, as I said, we've now been um, developing these in academia for, um, well, LISP is, 63, no, 64 years old. I know this because the language in which John, Mac sorry, the year in which John McCarthy created Lisp is the year I was born. So I'm exactly as old as Lisp. And I was very fortunate that when I went as an undergraduate to Stanford, John McCarthy was teaching there and I got to take his graduate Lisp class as an undergraduate. And that's what started me on the path to functional programming. Um, so anyhow, we've had functional languages for a while now. As I mentioned, Haskell started in 1987, so it's uh, over 30 years old now. Um, and we've been teaching these to our students. You've got a larger and larger, not every university teaches a functional language. Uh, actually, most of them, I think, will touch on functional languages. But most universities are still teaching something like Java or Python as their first language. Uh, but many places teach a functional language as their first language. MIT used to be famous for teaching Scheme as their first language. And the people who did that did that for 20 years and then retired. And the next people who took over decide, oh, no, we're going to do this in Python. So that we, we many of us in the community felt, oh, dear, that's a step backwards. But um, at Edinburgh, we teach Haskell first at Imperial. They teach Haskell first at Oxford and Cambridge. They teach Haskell first. Relatively few other places in the UK do. But when I was trying to convince, when I started at Edinburgh back in 2003, I said, right, we should do Haskell first. And my argument was, well, Oxford, Cambridge, and Imperial do it. And they said, okay, we should do it too. So uh, many of the places with a, a good reputation do functional first. Um, other places less so. But you're seeing more and more students come through that have been trained in these techniques. So it'll become easier and easier to get people trained in these techniques. And one of the things I find very interesting is I'm now often invited to developer conferences. There are just huge numbers of developers really interested in learning about new languages, including functional languages. So there really is um, a great interest in that in the developer community. Philip, um, I've asked the audience folks in the chat room, I've said, do share any experiences you've got with functional languages. Just put down, you know, the language you use, the application, and if you're allowed to say it, the name of your institution or at least the, the type. Philip, I was just wondering if you might, might just move a few more slides forward before we close. And I've got a couple more questions, but uh, just, just uh, a, a little bit further in your presentation, please. Okay, so I'll just do the last bit of the presentation which is I want to say a word about formal methods. So this is sort of uh, functional languages plus. So the most widely used um, for language for theorem proving 
is something called caulk. So this became famous, I think close to 20 years ago now. Uh, yeah, late 90s, I believe it was, when um, somebody completed a proof of the four color theorem in oh, caulk. Yeah. So okay. the four color theorem was notorious because it was very hard to prove. It was finally proved with a Fortran program. And uh, mathematicians rightly said, well, wait a minute, is that a proof? Um, so uh, caulk is a technique that basically encodes logic in a functional language. And uh, so they completed a proof of the four color theorem. There's something called the monster algebra theorem that they also proved that. It's um, the, the proof was first published in a mathematical journal was uh, order of 100 pages long. Um, so there's a lot of interest in doing this. These is used both for mathematics and for proving programs. So you have a complete C compiler proved, specified and proved to meet its specification written in caulk. Um, you have, at this point, actually people have done bits of the entire computing stack in caulk. There's a, a project now called Everest. It's not using caulk, it's using a different language, but very similar called F star. There's a project at Microsoft called Everest where they're proving cryptocurrency, um, sorry, cryptography algorithms uh, correct in F star. So there's a big push in this direction. DeepSpec is a large project run by some of my colleagues in the United States, funded by the National Science Foundation. And it's a big multi-million dollar project to ensure that there are more people trained in these techniques. So again, these are becoming more widely used. And it is, of course, much more expensive to prove something correct, but gives you much higher assurance. And um, because smart contracts are famous in Ethereum for losing, you know, in Ethereum, there's an uh, incident every six months where they lose another 10 million or $100 million worth of Ether. So all of a sudden, even though it's expensive, there are people who are actually interested in trying to prove programs correct. So Caulk is one of the most widely used. Another one is something called AGA. And um, I'm mentioning that because uh, I wrote a textbook on it, Programming Language Foundations in AGA. And I even got an award for best paper at the um, Brazilian Formal Methods Symposium, SBMF. So that's me in Salvador in Brazil. Um, holding up my best paper certificate. And then there are services that do this sort of thing. So one I'll mention is a company called Emandra, which has, they don't use Caulk or Agda, but they use their own language, which uses the same ideas. And they use this for reasoning about financial uh, operations. And one thing they did is for tr automated trading, there um, are rules about the order in which these things should come. So they formalize these rules, and there's an obvious property which an order should have, which is it's transitive. So what that means is that if A is less than B and B is less than C, then you immediately can conclude from that that A is less than C. This is a very natural property of or that or all ordering should have. And they took the rules, which were quite complex. I think they came from the um, Federal Trade Commission. Uh, for the order that trade should obey, and they showed it wasn't transitive, right? They tried to prove it was transitive, and in the course of trying to prove it was transitive, they discovered it wasn't transitive. So in, in some sense, what the official rules specified made no sense. So that's the sort of thing that you can do when you start to apply formal methods, and um, Amandra uh, carries these forward in the financial domain. So I think that's one interesting place to look if you're interested in formal methods. And that was sort of the basic thing that I wanted to go through about what's going on in this area. So I'll stop there. I think that's um, really important actually. So thank you very much, Philip. Uh, we've got time for just one or two quick questions slash comments, um, but very much on this formal methods element. Uh, we've got uh, we've got Maury here. Uh, Maury's asking, um, he's wondering whether some of these domain-specific languages would lend themselves to deontic logic and deontic programming. Um, so this has been an area that we've been exploring here in the city, uh, really to do with identity systems. Um, so it's kind of the um, deontic is basically the philosophy of ought rather than the philosophy of should. 
Do you have any comments on that? Well, I'm glad you explained what um, deontic means because I've encountered the word before, but I'm not very familiar with those kinds of logics. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you saw so I mentioned Deon Digital. That's exactly where they get their name from. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the answer to that would be yes, from what I know about what my colleagues are doing. But I can't say more because I don't know anything about that myself. I, I really ought to learn some form of deontic logic so I can have a better idea of what's going on there. I'm afraid I don't. And just a quick question before we have to close, sadly, and I've got a couple of very nice comments I'll send you. Um, really, looking to the future, um, basically, Elizabeth would like to know, as, as we look ahead, this increasing complexity in financial services where we, we see plethoras of products, much greater interconnectedness, uh, is that actually a driver for moving to functional programming, uh, you know, as opposed to uh, imperative? You mean when you want greater integration between products? Does Safe, that... safer, safer integration of more complexity. Well, really more, much about more complexity. If you want to manage complexity, I think functional languages do offer great advantages there for exactly the reasons that I was stressing about you can write something quickly, but understand what it's doing. That's exactly about managing complexity. Applying mathematics where you can, holding up that candle, that is also about managing complexity. So yes, I believe as people want to do more complex things, they will find that um, they get a huge advantage out of doing that in a functional language. Um, somebody yesterday was reminding me about Paul Graham's essay where he talks about um, building one of the first uh, web services, which was for building a digital store um, yeah. through the web. Yeah. web app. And um, he talks about their secret weapon for doing all this, which was Lisp again. And um, that was one of the earliest documented examples of how a functional language helps you manage complexity and do things more quickly than your competitors can do. So there's a, a tradition now going back to the early days of the web, at least, of functional languages offering people an advantage. Right. In the so look, uh, that's exactly all we've got time for. Um, I, I need to do uh, three rounds of thanks, uh, if I might. Uh, firstly, to uh, very much to all of our uh, members and supporters and sponsors. Our sponsors are wonderful and tolerant and allow us to explore things like this. And I hope this has been a really good taste for the audience and encourages them to explore. Uh, Philip mentioned at the end Paul Graham's paper. Uh, this is about the development of ViaWeb. Uh, and I, I know for a fact he, he says in this note something along the lines of, you know, why would you why would you broadcast to people that your secret sauce was a functional uh, programming language? Uh, and I do know of many other firms who are like that. Yes, we use Haskell, we use Lisp, but why do we want to broadcast that from the rooftops? Let the other competitors go slower more complicated and fall over. Um, so you'll find it when you start poking around and looking for it. Unfortunately, you'll also find COBOL, but let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, um, I'd like to thank all of you for watching. Uh, we've got a, a lot coming ahead. Uh, next week on Wednesday, there'll be another interesting technical talk about VR, AR, or MR. Uh, so we'll come on to that. We have a film showing on Wednesday night, a bit unusual for us, but we're gonna be looking at Life is Wonderful, Mandela's Unsung Heroes. Uh, make up some popcorn and join us and listen to Sir Nick Stadlin, who actually uh, created this fascinating documentary as he's interviewed about some of the issues behind it. But uh, as ever, go to the website. But my most important thanks really, Philip, are to you. It was so kind of you to pull this together, uh, to come down from Scotland uh, and address us here today in London. And I'd like to thank you very much. Unfortunately, I can't open the floodgates for the audience, but I do have my Korean karmic clapper and I will uh, uh, thank you appropriately. Here's your applause. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I hope that this taster is there, folks. Again, if you want to get in touch with Philip, his details are there, or let us know, and we'll connect you with him. Uh, but thank you, Philip. Okay, thanks very much. It's been my pleasure. Ours too.